Coming up in today's newscast, the IDF again strikes Hamas positions in the Strip after another overnight rocket attack. Russia demands more advance notice of Israeli operations in Syria, and a very special group will be participating this year in Tel Aviv's upcoming fifth annual Illustration Week. Israeli defense forces targeted eight Hamas terror positions in the Gaza Strip Wednesday night in response to yet another rocket attack on the Eshkol and Mechavim regions of southern Israel. Thankfully, there were no casualties or injured, but the attack comes just a week after two rockets were allegedly fired into Israel accidentally from the Strip, one of which hit a Be'er Sheva home when the Iron Dome failed to respond correctly. Last night, the Iron Dome batteries did fire, however, after sirens alerted to the attack around 11.17 p.m. The Iron Dome interceptor missile was redirected, though, after it was calculated that the Gaza rocket was to fall in an open field. Brigadier General Manelis from the spokesperson's unit in the IDF said that the Iron Dome wasn't meant to intercept rockets that don't pose immediate danger to human life or property. In fact, he explained that a successful interception can even be more dangerous if it means debris will fall down and scatter above populated areas. Meanwhile, in the ensuing Israeli Air Force response attack, Israeli jets hit three Hamas military compounds, a training camp, weapons storage and manufacturing buildings, and more. No terror group in the Strip has yet claimed responsibility for last night's attack, but according to the IDF spokesperson's unit, quote, the Hamas terrorist organization is responsible for everything happening in and out of the Gaza Strip, and it will bear the consequences of the terrorist acts carried out against the citizens of Israel, end quote. Meanwhile, back in Ramallah, Palestinian Authority President Abbas has just announced that the PLO may decide to abrogate many of its agreements with Israel and the United States, pending discussions at the upcoming PLO Central Council meeting later this month. Speaking to Palestine TV, Abbas said that the PLO plans to put all the agreements between the two nations on the table and review them, continuing that they intend to ask Israel to stop violating said agreements, and that, quote, perhaps we will arrive at the point of abrogating a lot of what is between us, end quote. Such threats aren't necessarily new coming from Abbas, and nothing has really ever come of them before, but this time the threat was announced following nearly a year of increased tensions with Israel, the United States, and Hamas, as well as internal pressures to both save face and consolidate power and control over the Palestinian territories. Hamas Fatah unity agreements, for example, have grinded to a halt, and the United States has made multiple moves that appear to reflect heavily downgraded relations between Washington and Ramallah. But until the PLO Council meets next week on October the 28th and 29th, it's impossible to know just how serious Abbas's rhetoric really is. UNRWA, or the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, alongside the Palestinian Authority and other related organizations, have long been accused of being riddled with anti-Israel and anti-Semitic incitement. It's primarily for this reason that the United States and Israel have already cut so much funding from the Palestinian territories. Yet, nothing seems to have been done. While at the United Nations Correspondents Association meeting on Wednesday of last week, Human Rights Monitoring Group, the Center for Near East Policy Studies, again presented their findings and suggested ways to finally fix the problem. Joining me now in the studio with more is the director of the Center for Near East Policy, David Bedeen. Thank you so much for coming back in good, today. Good to be here. All right, so David, you know, we mentioned earlier just now that, you know, you, you presented some of these findings about how incitement uh, to violence is, is really rife, and anti-Semitism really is rife throughout UNRWA mm -hmm. schools and the Palestinian Authority, uh, especially in the education system. But what was maybe one of the more big, like the bigger revelations that you uh, discussed with the UN? What you're seeing behind you is the footage we had 30 hours of footage. We share the, the raw tapes, but also a three-minute film uh, where we show how UNRWA had been infiltrated by, by Hamas, that Hamas had started something called the Al-Qutla Clubs, uh, military training uh, indoctrination sessions in all the UNRWA schools. The, the counselors and the teachers from UNRWA, who are dominantly predominantly Hamas, taking the kids to the border, marching them, giving them guns, and, and training them to invade Israel. So this isn't something that was done under the nose of UNRWA. This was done kind of in full view of Absolutely. UNRWA employees. Everything was done, is, is being done openly, without any hesitation to, to show exactly what's going on. UNRWA took over, the, Hamas took over the UNRWA Teachers Association and the Workers Association, and they dominate the schools. And what they did all summer was to train 100,000 children ages 9 to 15, giving them weapons, training them to take back their homes from 1948 mm -hmm. and kill the people who live there. And we're talking about places like Beersheba, Steyrod, Ashkelon, Eshdod. How is this, you know, is this surprising to people at the UN or, or on the council that you spoke to, you know? We appeared at the, uh, I brought three experts, 
uh, one who translated this Palestinian school books uh, that used by UNRWA, one who who examined, who, who filmed the, the, the these these took these films, and another who who revealed exactly how Hamas had gotten in, gotten in control of the schools. No one knows this. The correspondent we met with thir more than thirty correspondents. But, been, but Israel has been reporting this for years. No, Israel has in, Israel has, has mentioned that Hamas is all over the place. They haven't. It, it's not been in the Israeli media so much that the the actual schools have these Al Kutla clubs which are running the curriculum. Uh, it's been it's been hinted at, but it's not not been sh showed directly. And that's what we showed. And the correspondence there, they're not pro-Israel or anti-Israel. They just were they, they were just amazed. And now there's five major news agencies looking into this, and you, you see the guns. You know, this is this is a humanitarian agency that claims not to have funds. The funds. This is a war crime. Yeah, but they, it's war it, it, this is a child abuse, which is against all United right. Nations resolutions vis-a-vis -vis children, and they claim not to have funds for for basics such as med medical supplies, etc. Well, they have enough funds to give 100,000 children m military training, and the kids at the end of the summer take the Kalashnikov or the M M16 home, and that's yeah. what we're going to be facing. The kids, what we show in our films, you can see our films at IsraelBehindTheNews.com, IsraelBehindTheNews.com. You see the children motivated to take back their homes and kill the people who live there, and this is the UNRWA education. All right, well, David, thank, first of all, thank you again for coming in and, and sharing uh, your report with us, but uh, second of all, again, for anyone back at home who wants to see the full 10-minute video, uh, it's at IsraelBehindTheNews.com in the video section, and I think uh, we'll also post it to our YouTube later Excellent. Tonight. Let my people know, people don't know, we're starting something called the UNRWA Reform Initiative Campaign, so that UNRWA should be a humanitarian agency, right. not a military agency. All right, well, check it out. The Terror of Return, 10-minute video, we'll post it later. Thank you. Thank you. Russia is now demanding more advance notice prior to future Israeli strikes in Syria. Moscow argues that previously, Israel had informed them just minutes before an operation, but ever since the accidental downing of the Russian spy plane last month, which killed 15 Russian servicemen, Russia has taken a stricter approach towards Israel. Although Syrian surface-to-air missiles were the ones that hit the Russian aircraft, Russia blames Israel for instigating the scuffle haphazardly. But senior diplomatic authorities in Israel call Russia's new demands operationally unacceptable, and they're not taking them lightly. Over the past several years, the IDF has struck hundreds of Iranian and Hezbollah targets in Syria as they assert that an Iranian military presence in Syria could cause major destruction to the Jewish state. Russia's demands would vastly limit Israel's military prowess in Syria and could endanger Israeli aircraft. In addition, Iran would have more time to hide weapons and materials being targeted by Israel. Already last month, in response to the plane downing, Russia said it would give Syria more advanced S-300 air defense systems, and a satellite imaging firm has reported that four S-300 batteries are now deployed at a site near Masyaf, a northwestern Syrian city. Israel had previously carried out attacks against Syria's chemical weapons program at this exact location, and the site is also in close proximity to a Russian anti-aircraft battery, which happens to be one of the most advanced air defense systems in the world. Government leaders are reassuring Jerusalem church officials this week that the government of Israel has no intention to confiscate church lands or cause economic damage to the churches. This after the Armenian Greek Orthodox and uh, Roman Catholic churches sent Prime Minister Netanyahu a letter begging him to block a draft bill that would allow the state to intervene in the resale of residential property leases. The law in question was initially put forth by Kulanu lawmaker Rachel Azaria in February and was in response to the resale of church-owned properties and or leases to private businesses. But the state made clear that it's unacceptable for any private person or business, especially abroad, to own such large swaths of the capital. And residents of the areas in question were also left in the dark as to their new landowners' identities, potential policy changes or rent hikes. So the new draft of the bill would have allowed for the confiscation of certain church-owned lands. Regional Cooperation Minister Tzachi Anegbi even met with church leaders Tuesday night to further explain that the goal of the government's draft law is, quote, to protect the rights of the churches, investors, and tenants, end quote. But the legislation has been harshly criticized by church leaders, several of whom protested this week by closing the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, a pilgrimage center for Christians all over the world. Israeli police in the city arrested several church members for blocking the site, and this is after Prime Minister Netanyahu already prevented the Knesset Committee for advancing the legislation on Sunday. The committee discussions were delayed for a week. But upon meeting, the Ministerial Committee for Legislation will delve deeper into the merits of the draft and decide whether to advance it to the general vote in Parliament or not. The draft is listed as a law for tenants' rights, and according to M.K. Azaria, it's allegedly aimed at solving the problem of, quote, thousands of Jerusalem residents who could lose their homes due to the demands of developers, end quote. The bill does not specifically mention any church properties. 
Espionage is a tough gig, and according to Mossad chief Yossi Cohen, it's only getting tougher as security services and technological advancements such as facial recognition become stronger and more readily available. Well, ILTV's correspondent Doriel Mizrahi is here now to tell us all about how the Mossad plans to overcome these challenges. Hey Aaron, thanks. So surprise, surprise, the Mossad hates facial recognition. Mm. And in a rare public speech, Mossad director Yossi Cohen admitted that facial recognition technology is challenging the Mossad and it trickles out around the world. He explained that it's getting harder to spy because the same technologies that catch terrorists can sometimes uncover foreign intelligence operations. Just take a listen to what he had to add on the subject. <laughs> הדבר הזה הוא בהחלט חוויה. לאנשים שרוצים שלא ידעו מי הם כל כך, העניין הזה הוא כמובן אתגר אחר. אמרתי שאני לא ארחיב, אבל אתם יכולים לדמיין שחלק גדול מבעיות או אתגרי הארגון מדברות על כך שהדרכון שלך בעצם נמצא בתביעת האצבע שלך, בקשתית העין שלך או בפרצופך. All right, well, I totally get uh, what he's saying there, although it's funny because it's, it's actually a really simple issue if you think about it, uh, but unless you're faced with it, you know, you really wouldn't think about it at all. So, uh, again, though, you know, how do you think that the Mossad is overcoming this challenge? So, obviously, current and former Mossad agents restrained from commenting about that, but there was an interview with the Jerusalem Post with a former IDF intelligence agent, and there he said that there are two ways to beat facial recognition. One, through cutting-edge technology to defend against these programs, and the other is to alter one's appearance, which is pretty crazy, but believable. I mean, yeah, it's, it's not too terrible, I guess, you know. Uh, but, you know, to, more to the first point that you mentioned, I also heard that there is multiple Israeli companies who are developing anti-facial recognition programs. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, for sure. There's one company specifically that stands out, which is called DID, which protects people's photo by resynthesizing them and enabling them to be on the internet without releasing their biometric data. It's really something. But I also must add that the technology was not engineered for the Mossad, but rather for business people who want to share their appearance in marketing material, for example, without it being scooped up by identity mm -hmm. thieves that could use it against them. Very interesting. But, you know, what about some of the other scenarios that a Mossad agent may find him or herself in? You know, what are, what are some of the other tools that they may find useful? That's a fun question. So I was reading a few articles, and one option I read was that there are eyeglasses which use infrared light or flashes to full facial recognition, but are undetectable to the human eye. Other more Hollywood-like ways is to fool technology, is to wear a baseball hat and possibly a wig. Then, you know, there's also the old-school tactics where you can have makeup to somewhat alter the human face. Yeah, so, so that's that's what I was thinking, you know, like fake mustaches and fake beards and things and other really low-tech, non-permanent facial adjustments. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, and I know that most of that stuff is really just seen in Hollywood, but honestly, it doesn't seem that far-fetched for undercover agents. Yeah, and to me, honestly, it's interesting to see both facial recognition technology develop and see how companies counter that. All right, well, until then, uh, thank you for the update, Dorian. Thanks, Aaron. Police investigators are now apparently completed with their investigations into Prime Minister Netanyahu. The report first broke on Chadashot Television News last night and maintains that the police will present their findings to the state prosecutor's office within the next six months. An unnamed source within the state prosecutor's office told Chadashot News that everyone would also be surprised by how quickly a police recommendation would be made. Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit would then be responsible for making a decision one way or another after receiving word from the police investigations team. The police's Lachab 433 anti-corruption unit has long been looking into the prime minister in connection to three major cases, dubbed cases 1000, 2000, and 4000, which all relate to various charges ranging from illegal quid pro quo agreements to outright graft and bribery. Police already publicly recommended indictments against Netanyahu in February over cases 1000 and 2000, but have since reopened the cases and have not updated their recommendations. Netanyahu has also been questioned a dozen times in relation to these investigations, but has continued to vociferously maintain his innocence. In addition to the aforementioned cases, though, Netanyahu has also been suspected of pushing for legislation that would protect elected officials like himself from indictment. The immunity law, as the amendment has become known, was initiated by Likud M.K. Mikitsohar and would reverse the current law. Currently, to use immunity, a Knesset member would have to go through a vote in Parliament. The amendment would instead grant immunity automatically and require a Knesset vote to enable an indictment. But Netanyahu has already ordered Sohar to delay the advancement of the bill, saying he's convinced there will be no indictment anyway because there's nothing to indict over. Following the end of a year-long discrimination suit, French authorities have now announced that 
As of early October, they would be suspending the requirement of the labeling of Israeli products pending a decision by the European Court of Justice. Now, the requirement had originally come into play in 2015 when the European Commission adopted strict labeling regulations, ordering that products made in East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank must be labeled with the words Israeli colonies. The suspension of the requirement was initiated by a 2017 lawsuit filed by the Lawfare Project, which provides pro bono legal services to protect human rights. It was filed against Bruno Le Maire, the French Minister for Economic Affairs and Finance. An executive director of the Lawfare Project, Brooke Goldstein, applauded the decision but regretted that more had not been done both before the requirement was initially passed and now. She said, quote, The entire issue could easily have been rendered moot had the French government announced that the policy, which clearly contradicts EU and French trade laws, would be suspended indefinitely, end quote. She continued that we never should have reached a situation like this in the first place, where Israeli companies must rely on European courts to enforce basic economic rights. And Israel has also played an active role in protesting against the regulations. While the European Union and most of its member states view the settlements as illegal and the West Bank as occupied territory, Israel recognizes the Golan, Jerusalem, and the disputed Judea and Samaria, where most Jewish settlements are legal municipal entities, as part of its territory. Only Greece and Hungary rejected outright the European Commission's regulations that penalized these areas. Are you interested in learning a new skill or perhaps sharing one of your own many talents with others? Well, Israeli startup Venuware has just created a skill sharing platform that instantly connects people in face-to-face -face interactions so that they can do just that. And here to tell us all about it is Venuware co-founders, CEO Rami Schechter and his son, COO Itai Schechter. Thank you both so much for coming in. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. Great so uh, let's start off with what Venuware does exactly and how. So actually we create a new way to share your experience and knowledge. And uh, we found out that Almost everyone got at least one skill, something that they're doing the best. And right now they are sharing the skill with their friends and family. Sure. And we said, why not to share it with everyone in the world? Imagine when you have free time, just like turning on the light, everyone in the world can see that you are available and approach to you via live video, voice and chat. Wow. You can set your own price per minute or you can get help by people that you need their skill. So you can make money off of this app. Absolutely. So, and, and was this, you know, how did you guys come up with this with this? So uh, actually program? it came from a real need before Venuware, me and Rami owned a marketing agency and I did a lot of Facebook and Google advertising. Then a lot of people reached out to me, asked me Itai, how to promote the folks on Facebook, on so Google. So they're asking for your skill of how to yeah. advertise. And, okay. and we figure out, you know what, I can share it with my close circles, uh, but not with the entire world. So let's mm -hmm. build something that can facilitate that. And so today, how many people are sharing their skills? Right now, we are not operational. Okay. We tested it in few verticals. One yeah. of the interesting, uh, uh, most interesting vertical was Apple customer service. Really? Actually, uh, using regular people, in two weeks, we, be we become the biggest and the only live video customer service using regular people, just like you, if you are good with Apple products. Sure. Uh, we found out that there is million searches in Google for Apple customer service. And uh, incredible. Yeah, there is a lot of demand and a lot of people who are good with a product that are happy. And we're talking about like a real, like an economy that is basically could, could start from this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's incredible. Actually, we're going to talk about the opportunity for business and innovate the sure. convention of uh, people and uh, computer, HR. Yeah. HR. Uh, it's uh, about the future of the world workforce. Actually, it's going to be from these device, the biggest workforce in the world, using platforms like Skype anywhere. That makes sense. You know, we're already kind of leaning towards that way. People working from home or online or really, you know, from anywhere as long as they have a, an online hookup. Yeah, and we provide another channel to connect them and allow them to monetize through anywhere. Wow. All right. So first of all, when is it going to be available and, and where should people be looking for it? Uh, it's going to be available in a few months. Right now, we, there is a demo in the iOS version, so you can download it and play with it and even contact us or, or talk with other skillers. Uh, but in a few months, it's going to be operational, be Android, uh, iOS, and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, come to be a skiller in our yeah. platform. Yeah, come share your skill it's, with us. It sounds like a very good opportunity. I think a lot of people are probably going to take you up on that offer. Uh, Rami, Itai, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Thank anywhere. you for having us. Thank you, guys. Thanks. It's a pleasure. In other news, the fifth annual Tel Aviv Illustration Week is beginning soon, from November 15th to the 24th. More than 50 art exhibitions will be on display across many museums, galleries, and other venues throughout Tel Aviv, and hundreds of famed veteran Israeli artists, along with up-and-coming artists and artist collectives, will get to share their creations with the world. 
For anyone who wants a more enriched experience, there will also be guided tours, some of which will feature the artists and museum curators uh, to give viewers the opportunity to discover new and unique techniques while admiring the art. But among the more incredible exhibits featured in this festival is Hanging from a Thread, an exhibit by the Cucinate Organization, an African refugee women's collective, which aims to explain who the asylum seekers in Israel really are, what they're doing with their lives, and how, they current, how their current locale differs so greatly from their native countries. Now, the Hanging from a Thread exhibit will be located in the Abram Hostel and will mainly showcase crocheted and woven pieces, including baskets, rugs, and poofs. And in fact, the word Cucinate is Tigrinya, or the language of Eritrea, and translates to crochet. An outside illustration week, Cucinate mainly seeks to empower refugee women by teaching them life skills, and they also hold workshops and community outreach programs for the Tel Aviv community. So if you're interested in supporting this incredible organization, and I think you should be, uh, or even just taking in their amazing uh, show, upcoming showcase, look them up at Cucinate.com, and remember that the illustration week events are mostly free, so make sure to check it out. And now we turn to ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh for this week's Top 5. With Gal Gadot being the most popular Israeli on Instagram with over 21 million followers, there are many more Israelis whose perfectly filtered and curated feeds are gaining crazy attention here in Israel and abroad. So, I'm here to give you guys ILTV's top five list of rising Israeli Instagram stars you should definitely follow. First up is the young, the beautiful, and extremely talented Anna Zak. This 17-year-old is one of Israel's biggest social media stars. She models and sings and started her career back in 2014 on the Israeli kids reality show, The Boys and Girls. Since then, Anna has racked up more than 1.1 million followers on Instagram, along with her first single, Money Honey. And it doesn't end there. Zach actually was ranked the number one most influential Israeli on Instagram last year, ahead of supermodel Bala Faeli. I'd follow her if I were you. Second up is Talia Sutra. After living in New York for the past 17 years, Talia made her way back to Tel Aviv after traveling the world, hosting yoga workshops and trainings. Her feed is filled with impressive yoga poses I wouldn't dare try myself, inspiring mantras, and a stunning views of Israel. If you're looking for the best yoga teacher in the city, definitely check out Talia's page. Third on the list is the stunning and beyond talented Dana Zalmon. This fashion forward entrepreneur has done it all. She started a blog about fashion and lifestyle back in 2014. She landed a role on the Israeli reality series It Girls that she helped create and now started her own Instagram academy to help others create unique and timeless feeds just like her own. I've been following her for a while. Are you? Fourth up is the young Israeli model Barak Shamil. While he's just 19 years old, Shamil is not shy about sharing his life on Instagram. Known for his mop of curly hair and then shaving it publicly before enlisting in the IDF, Barak has modeled for some of the top designers, including international brands like Versace, Nike, D Square 2, and so many more. He's single right now, ladies. You better go follow. Last, but of course never least on the list, Lital Rosenstein. This quirky Instagram has been the talk of the town for months now. Lital's feed is filled with food photos featuring fruits and veggies, with goofy googly eyes, candy piled slices of toast, and more creative mouth-watering pics. When Instagram turned to Lital back in 2016 to design a creative photo for Rosh Hashanah, her googly-eyed pomegranate shot got almost 1 million likes. If you're a foodie, go follow. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, in honor of French authorities who suspended European labeling laws recently, our Hebrew word of the day is to label or le tayeg. Previously, products from the Golan, Jerusalem, and the West Bank were all metuyag or labeled as being made in the Israeli colonies. But thankfully, after a minor lawsuit, this type of tiug or labeling has been outlawed, at least for now. So now, Israeli product makers, sellers, and distributors can all rejoice knowing that this discriminatory practice has been ended. I, for one, would definitely let Tayeg or label that a success. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be mostly clear and comfortable with a low of about 68 or 20 degrees Celsius. Then over the weekend, you can expect partly cloudy skies with a chance of rain and a drop in temperatures to a high of around 73 or 23 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.69 shekels for the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras, and thank you for watching.